Hello everyone, today we introduce the tactics of the Wars of the Roses and some additional note on the character of uh, its warfare, which is very peculiar, right, in the history of the Middle Ages, and that we'll try to outline briefly. And naturally we'll make a video for each battle, yes, of, of the Wars of the Roses at some point. We never, we never did, quite, um, so, but it will happen, so this is what should serve in fact as a a preparatory um, approach so as is understandable in a civil war like uh, the war of the roses actually was the contenders were confronted with armies of virtually identical structure right it was a war among englishmen uh, as recalls if you want even the, the later uh, civil war um, and so we're talking about the same composition and the same military culture, which at this point, in the case of mid-15th century England, derived directly from the just-ended Hundred Years' War, where surely the English had played uh, uh, pro possibly one of the most important tactical roles in the history, not just of medieval warfare, but you know, in the annals of military history, but where they had also lost endlessly. Uh, so, we know that on the French fields, cavalry had, on many occasions, proved uh, itself vulnerable to archers. Um, for this reason, uh, the French knights had been forced, in many occasions, to, to dismount. Uh, I, we never actually made uh, a bit about the tactics of the Hundred Years War, we talk about here, here and there, right? It technically... Um, the general picture is much less stereotypical, right? Um, there were certain practices, both from the French and English side, that were dictated more by, uh, you know, obvious contingencies than just a pre, you know, a, a kind of a standardized a tactical mode. Uh, actually, the English were more on that side, right? They properly had, since the time the Scottish Wars had learned right from during the the reigns of Edward the first the second and finally the third as the, you know the fulfillment of that system naturally to fight on foot to, to integrate this important uh, mis missile power of you know long bowmen together with dismounted men at arms all things that we will have to well more in detail at some point um, but um, so the, the the point here is that the, the on, on the fields of 15th century France, a lot of important changes had occurred. First of all, just the longbow uh, volume of fire had brought uh, the French, and uh, as a consequence, as you know, the hybridizing power that war has, also their opponents, um, to, to develop uh, more modern armor, let's say, uh, capable of deflecting the powerful longbow arrows. Also, and more importantly, and basically one of you know, uh, only of the most important tactical reasons also of the English demise, artillery had made its appearance. Um, the French have to take it in a sense. Naturally, it's not that the French won because artillery appeared, but naturally, from from a tactical point of view, they um, they made important use of it. They they had also you know certain capabilities at some point, however, uh, acquired because of a, the broader political and strategical events as they had unfolded at that point. Um, but let's say that the, the, the fields of the, um, say the last phase of the Hundred Years' War had showed, finally, uh, artillery as a decisive weapon on some occasion on the battlefield. Um, this is important because medieval artillery still at this point is mostly about siege warfare, right? But th this is for, from the 1420s. Let's say ev every updated prince has its own artillery part. doesn't matter where small. And on some instances, you know, artillery will f make a full difference um, on the field by, by the 16th century um, in Europe. But uh, at this point, the, you, you can see during this, uh, these last battles of the war, definitely uh, some of the, the most advanced use of it in that, in that regard, especially from the French side indeed. Um, and so all these factors are to be found uh, consequently, in the campaigns of the Wars of the Roses, right? Um, 
This is important because armies that are too similar to allow one or, or the other of the containers to enjoy any asymmetrical factor to stimulate tactical innovations bring to to a stasis that is naturally to be found into a political and social uh, cause of why the, the armies of, of the Wars of the Roses were like that. We will make actually a video specifically dedicated to the organization of these armies, why they were like that. T to make long story short, um, the you know the end of uh, you know the loss of, of English France, let's say, had um, brought all these various captains and lieutenants that through the Indian tour since the time of Edward the Third had made up effectively uh, kept making up actually the royal army and one of magnates had reversed in England. These people were hungry, they were skilled in arms, uh, they were veterans. Uh, was especially among the captains, there were many at the beginning of the Wars of the Roses um, that had, had that experience and they began to, to, to disrupt fundamentally the political institutional order, the civil order, justice uh, by intimidating the judges to creating this, um, uh, to weakening essentially royal power and creating private clientels because the, the English yeomanry at that point uh, felt exposed and uh, they didn't have much of another option but to join these magnates that began to create essentially their private armies in this context and uh, that's what fueled essentially also the Wars of the Roses in its in its dynamics. Um, but in exactly for this reason what we see in England is something very different that is um, is happening on the continent because um, in here, infantry was, uh, I mean, um, um, in continental Europe, infantry was acquiring an overwhelming, innovative inertia, uh, while the armies of the Wars of the Roses did not promote infantry on the model as was being developed by Castilla um, in, that, in that years was engaged in, in the completion of the conquest of uh, Granada, or the Swiss that were in turn capable of marking the fate of Charles the Bold of Burgundy that had been a major ally of the same English during the, the, the Hundred Years War and then it had also actually a lot of Englishmen right among its ranks and longbowmen also copied uh, fundamentally as a um, for their pa firepower in, um, in, in the functionalization of Burgundian tactics um, and uh, that speaks for you know eventually a change that would render England, I would say only by the mid 16th century though, um, you know, out of date. You know, at this point, objectively, um, in England and let's say Britain, it all largely meant, uh, enclosing itself at this point. And during Renaissance warfare, England still had, a, if you want, a retro army and it also depended on some, you know, think about the horse breeds or some technologies um, uh, usually Italian armor, Flemish artillery. Um, we will see that during the Wars of the Roses there were actually also uh, foreign mercenaries, not many, telling the truth. But let's say that in order to understand this war, you have to understand the specific background that exists in there. Um, so while on the continent lots of, you know, quite important changes were were and also s simply by scale were taking place in England things were different and if you want they, they were following more familiar roads but at the same point when you think of a civil war you think objectively of the, uh, the disruption of, of an order right the idea that objectively we made a video on this about the, the solidity of the English kingdom from a political institutional point of view that had been fueled um, England was a, a country of consistent political unity since the time of, of the Anglo-Saxons. In a way, the Normans had inherited this. Um, the Plantagenets had boosted the, the, the system, had made it stand and then develop functionally. And with Edward III, you have properly the co-optation also of these military leaders uh, in, in the assembly in exchange for the, the creation of this important military retinues um, that would make so, so much uh, would have so much success during the Hundred Years' War. And, you know, if, if England hadn't won battles like Crécy, uh, or Poitiers, or Arzincourt, um, probably England would have not 
uh, we, as we know, it would have not been like that, right? The, these kingdoms were, doesn't matter how unitary and solid they were, like the English one, it, they were always one step away from, from disaster, from collapse, from internal strife. If you want, the, the, the Wars of the Roses is the consequence of the defeat during the Hundred Years' War. So um, that is quite evident. And what this, why, when this happens, you have objectively um, the difficulty of creating a unitary army. Right? Why? Because England now is fractioned among different powers, or at least you know, different individuals, magnates, military leaders that are contending the throne, um, and um, this prevents, uh, in a way, a country that also didn't have dramatic, I don't know, demographic capabilities, for example. But that might have not even be the problem. But you know, the idea is that what the Swiss were doing, for example, what the Castilians were doing, uh, was based on that political unity. The idea that you have countries with, you know, that have a population in the range of millions that you can start organizing unitarily to to have a to create a professional army, which is something extremely costly. Nobody up to this point, up to the Swiss in the mid 15th century, have ever managed to do during the Middle Ages, um, and that that England cannot have at this point because it's if it's a dynastic clash between you know powerful magnates that just fight as we'll see at the end of the video also for a limited time right this is not a total war this is literally uh, it assumes the character of a dynastic struggle that paradoxically you know the the house of lords would have been decimated at the end of the war it would favor the you know Tudor's England political unity at that point because uh, you know more power properties had fallen and, and that point in the hands of fewer and fewer um, and that's why the Wars of the Roses were like that because we were literally killing the noblemen killing each other right for succeeding dynastically speaking which is from one side I mean war was disruptive naturally but it could have been far worse because this didn't have much of a you know social background behind this right you know there the were important dynamics under that point of view but it wasn't like a major upheaval for which uh, the whole country was devastated no it was very contained if you want very close of its in very political wars um, and very contained in, in time as campaigns in numbers even as armies right um, and and this of course, couldn't produce like you know armies of thousands of of, of pikemen, orderly, sent in professional arms fighting against someone. Else. No, right? Uh, the English actually had um, achieved in um, something similar, let's say, in embryo during the Hundred Years' War itself. Also, because they simply went fighting in someone else's uh, home, so they also the problem of maintaining these troops was living off the land, devastating France, and and, and, and therefore sparing England from much of, of those um, of those uh, you know damage uh, those damages in social instances at the same time considering many English lords in England were essentially living as petty kings also as far as their their military uh, retinues were concerned right they they had this kind of privatistic mindset so this is what triggers in a way if we were to, to make it to reduce it to the bone the you know the, the, the broader uh, picture of, of of the of the war. Therefore, the main nucleus of the English armies at this point was made up of noble men at arms, recruited on the basis of uh, allegiance and family loyalty. Let's say, and um, the greatest weight of the fight uh, was over them. Right, their number and, and morale. Um, they, the final outcome of the battles was decided was, was decided by them. Uh, this is important and intuitive in the sense that, as we will see, there was actually a few cavalry, uh, or better, properly mounted cavalry on, uh, though not absent. Right, not absent was uh, present, but um, these were the the hardest uh, stopping unit you could find there. Right, it's just like the Hundred Years' War tactics. Um, it was not the longbowmen that actually stopped the men at arms, where they mounted or dismounted. It was just this, you know, combined tactics that was, you know, with missile fire aimed at disrupting the order of of cavalry charges that did, however, arrive um, on uh, against the English lines and were halted by these. You know, this man at arms. That at this point in history become literally the heaviest thing that that has ever been there, right? The full plate armor, 
of the, the 15th century is the, the the century of the greatest level of armoredness, let's say, yes, especially in these countries, uh, with the the highest level of technology ever reached because by the, f the 16th century basically uh, armor uh, also numerically speaking shrank right? yet there, there were uh, armors like the Maximilian one that were implemented and so on it, they would remain up to the throughout the, the 17th century but with firearms those became so costly to stop power that you know even just for sake of physical movement that it was more profitable to 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 pay for having firearms than for for armor um, in terms of effectiveness, if you ever wonder why armor was abandoned, um, and the um, so these guys, these men at arms, were those who went out there and technically weren't even just properly killed by longbowmen. As we all see, it was mostly other infantry would kill other, other men at arms of commoners that would be armed with specific armor uh, weapons to to break through the armor. Longbows naturally had quite of a variety of uh, arrows types some were designed to you know short range to actually also yes uh, cause damage to armored men um, but uh, you don't find armies where missile fire at this point makes it alone run not even mm, gunpowder once because as we will see at this point actually the mm, uh, weapons like crossbows and longbows were still more effective mm -hmm. And it would remain. Uh, actually, as we were saying before, uh, um, it's only by the, the mid-16th century that even the English uh, longbow uh, becomes outdated on the field. Because up to that point, it technically worked. Like, uh, as crossbows sometimes even did, right? And this is considering that England was just, you know, less versed than other countries also in terms of firearms. So they mostly concentrated their force with longbowmen, as they had been used now for, to do for centuries. That it was still effective. Um, and so these English men-at-arms were armored from head to toe in the most updated Italian armor, sometimes German armor as well, um, but it seems I was listening to a video from his colleague like yesterday, it was mostly Italian, right? Um, and also because that was the most, you know, important industry at the time. Um, they, mm, these men-at-arms fought with one or two-handed you know, traumatic weapons, mostly pole axes, hammers, things like these, because that's the only thing, the, the, the only tools capable, let's say, of breaking through those prodigies of defensive technology uh, with some well-aimed blows. And that's what makes also these weapons preferred by knights, because they have to fight against other knights and have literally to, to, to bring them down, right? So it's either this thing or double hand uh, swords that can you know deliver that fatal blow that can break the connections between the plates and so on um, and uh, we'll see also the multiple functions of certain weapons in terms of fracturing piercing hooking cutting power right depending on on the type of target so uh, it's a very physical thing right these guys are like athletes right if, if you look at the corpses men at arms of be found at this point, uh, even just during um, the, the they're like football players, right? And it's not that you know the, the physicality uh, is is fundamental in many ways. It's not what makes the war in it, but definitely these guys are the spearhead of the for me. That's what they have to do, right? So and it takes an astonishing training. This is the uh, the professional elite of medieval, medieval war. That's they did for a lifetime spent training and or simply fighting for real right in war tournaments at home right um so uh, it's fair to say battles of the wars of the roses are decided by the hand-to-hand -hand fight between armored men at arms who have made war their main occupation uh so we're talking about bloody and ferocious clashes right that began with um in, in, let's say these traumatic weapons, these impact weapons, and at the end with thin, long, and sturdy stilettos capable of slipping into the slits of the armor and delivering blows to, to the eyes, throat, armpits, or any weak point of the armor, right? And these guys are fighting to kill each other, mostly at this point, because that's what they, they have to knock each other out for political reasons now, not much ransoming each other. Um, and they are intense fights. Um, 
Uh, however, they rarely exceed two or three hours because supporting about 50 kilos of weapons and armor for long periods and perhaps in, in the hot season is not humanly possible. Doesn't matter how robust and trained English men at arms were. Um, and also, fights naturally, the fight, the actual fighting, uh, I mean, combat time was for the individuals was much less, right? Because up after a few minutes, you are already exhausted and you have to spare. Um, uh, resources for uh, you know for for other moments of the battle, uh, and uh, so it, it's um, it the also the rhythm of of these battles it would be int very interesting to observe in in each individual clash we will be studying at some point hopefully. Um, there are exceptions to the length of these battles, for example, that however confirmed the rule in a way, such as the Battle of Tau Town, uh, which lasted from dawn to dusk. Um, the f type of recruitment we described before, so that the bonds either, you know, feudal loyalty or clanterly, you know, um, allegiance, uh, somehow forced the commanders of the Wars of the Roses to line up in the midst of their own troops and to fight together with them, right? So th these men were leading uh, by example and fully sharing the risks of the struggle. Uh, this naturally had some important consequences at different levels because from a f in terms of morale that's positive for, for the troops, right? You, you have your own commander fighting next to you, literally, uh, dismounted. But from the commanding point of view there are some limits posed by this because the commander could be, uh, you know, hit and killed in, in, in the melee so the, the banner uh, with his insignia knocked down and this would automatically loosen the bond of loyalty that the, the, his clients felt, you know, compelled to. So uh, at this point, it could happen that the entire formation of the magnate, maybe it was just one of the of the virus that composed the army at the moment, decided to have had, you know, uh, enough at that point to and and uh, to be free to go home during the battle, <laughs> in the midst of the battle. Um, valiant commanders like King Edward the Fourth undefeated in battle could also be said to be very lucky to have survived such uh, events. And uh, beyond this, however, um, it is also obvious that if, you know, if the commander is just uh, lined up with his own men, dismounted, uh, he couldn't actually have control of the progress of the battle. Right? He, all he could do was to organize it uh, in the best possible way in advance, right? Because uh, the, it, his overall, mm, its overall development, uh, he could have certainly not, you know, uh, had a, an overview of. And um, this doesn't mean, however, that the battles of the Wars of the Roses were devoid of important tactical um, dynamics, uh, deception, you know maneuvering or use of reserves, decisions taken at the moment, right? Also, um, careful, uh, albeit not always successful battlefield preparations, right? And uh, it is symptomatic in this regard that whoever took the initiative by attacking was often the winner over whoever held, in spite of all logic, a defensive position. So um, this speaks, in a sense, for the, uh, as always, for the preeminence of moral forces in war. The idea that attackers were more motivated to break through the enemy lines, and we have seen how this was literally spearheaded by the man at arms. So there was a, a great determination driven by political reasons that, um, you know, conferred, uh, as we've seen, to this fundamentally, you know, approximately symmetrical uh, armies, you know, uh, an advantage over the the one who was more eager to, to, to come to, to grip with the enemy and to, to break through the enemy um, the defenses, because we'll see also that there was a, an important deal of entrenchment. Um, another important mm, element uh, of the English armies at this point were commoners, right? They weren't just men at arms, noblemen. Uh, uh, the commoners were enlisted for war through uh, the to a system either royal delegation or feudal bond, fundamentally, their origin could be quite mixed. Numerically, how they they constituted as always during the Middle Ages the greater part of the army, right? Um, 
However, the, the, there was a difference between their, you know, uh, their, their tactical function because the majority of them actually fought with bows, right? We've seen that England um, had specialized itself, in that, uh, you know, to the also the local communities to practice intensively with long bows to, to keep fit. You have this reserve of men that now had also found a living uh, with, you know, offering this this capacity. Um, there were, however, also mm, properly melee troops stopping, you know, having infantry with, armed with um, fighting with traumatic weapons together with the men at arms, right? Uh, however, there, the role of this specific um, specialty is pretty much, um, you know, is scarcely documented. We don't know much about it, which speaks for... Uh, generally speaking, either mm, pretty much you know uh, the the similarity to the men at arms tactics, aside they were on average naturally less armored than them, but in terms of you know combat, that's pretty much you know, they were pretty much similar, uh, and or simply because there were literally not many, right? And it's normal for medieval standards not to know much about these types of troops, but it's significant that we know still more about. The men at arms, of course, but also the longbowmen in their stead. So even across social distinction, uh, uh, so that we presume their their importance was not dramatic. At least it wasn't superior to these other two specialties. So these commoners, uh, these melee uh, troops, uh, were mostly armed with um, pole-mounted weapons, similarly uh, similar to the to the halberd. That is the bill, right? Capable. Of uh, hitting with the point and cutting, but also able being able to hook the opponent to, to break through his armor. Um, so they, it's a very the, the bill and these uh, similar weapons. There's an important variety. Uh, there were the gloves. Um, you know, they 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 came out. This evolved quite uh, you know, variedly from. This, this variety of pole arms fundamentally, um, but we, we can't imagine these troops were able to, to master these four effects to good use. However, the resistance of the commoners in combat was limited, especially by the material impossibility of obtaining armor at the level of the, uh, the one of the men at arms, uh, against whom themselves they had no great hopes, right? And not just because the men at arms were better trained. Uh, than them. Um, moreover, consider what we were saying before that uh, the the British Isles didn't see at the time a great deal of development of pikemen formations, so um, that could have kept you know the the, the most uh, title let's say opponents uh, at a distance. That's mostly what the unarmored troopers do. So this also speaks for a subsidiary role of individuals like the billmen etc that mostly made mass you know helped also by field fortification and so on but didn't uh, didn't have much of a of a chance against a men at arm unless they were overwhelmingly superior in number or simply you know in terms of moral or the tactical situations that were at uh, the advantage of is uh missile troops had um arguably a more important role. The archers, and as we'll see also the cannons, had the task of starting the battle with the preparatory shot to soften up the enemy lines as possible. Um, it's obvious that the the English uh, had, you know, experienced the effects of longbow arrows on, on, on others uh, at the point that they, they knew how to take all necessary countermeasures in turn to minimize the, the the effects of their own tactics right there. so that's the point of fighting civil war at this point so uh, for this reason in the wars of the roses um, you could say that uh, you know being their longbowmen from both sides the they minimize their own effects in a draw so archers proved effective in this sense not because they didn't actually have an impact. They caused it, they, you know, they, they, they were brought on the field. But they, they could make the difference only in, in episodic uh, instances, especially when the two parts had, in fact, an unequal number of them that would favor uh, the, the more numerous. Uh, also, it's pretty much obvious that the longbowmen 
ability to resist the attack of the men at arms was was cars right I, uh, first of all because they were largely unarmored uh but also because they didn't have much of an offensive armament right uh they you know sometimes they they were actually at this point uh yeah, I mean, every archer could have a sword or things like that, but, you know, swords, first of all, especially the, the one-hand ones are not this great deal against plate armor. Um, during the, the Hundred Years' War, the the English archers had things like little hammers to knock down, or give the final blow to, to, to any, the fallen enemies and things like that. But, they, you know, that the slight infantry, they're not meant to stand their ground. Right, nor against cavalry, nor against other, you know, against heavy infantry. Um, so, men at arms could close in them to conduct with little damage, albeit the archers are lighter, so they they can run away. Right, they escape. They don't have uh, any other choice, and they're gonna hopefully for them leave for another day. Uh, but as we've seen. The, the men at arms were the sharpest properly of, of these armies. Right? The objective was knocking out the men at arms. Once, once it was done, their clientels they, they melted away. So the rest of the troops were less important also for this reason. Um, like in France, the I mean during during the Hundred Years' War, the English armies of the Wars of the Roses were usually divided into three battles or bar wards, as they were called. Um, but, you know, we will see how mm, eventually every battle differs in this regard. It seems that a, that an important change compared to, to France was that the, the vanguard was now um, importantly increased in size and also, for, for this reason, detached also from more, to, to be a greater distance ahead from the rest of the main uh, uh, the main body of the army. This may speak intuitively now. I, I don't know what, it, what where this information is actually is referring to, but you know, it's easily just to having, um, let's say, a more to buy time and to assess maybe the, the consistency of the enemy. Given that, as we've seen, these men at arms that led the the army were risking their own lives specifically, right? So um, armies were also tendentially uh, smaller. So there was more interest to you know to have a backup plan of sort to to maintain to to, to buy time to eventually retreat and so on. Um, it um, this um, this uh, the the vanguard as we we'll say also contained great part of the army's archers that also can't buy time keeping the enemy at bay for a while. In the sense that um, you don't spare your men at arms and first. Uh, wave uh, against archers can't run away. You're gonna exhaust them so that when the other men, the, fre the enemy fresh men at arms arrive, you can overwhelm them. So, hence the symmetry. The enemy would have a, a vanguard similarly composed, and they would basically neutralize each other and just give time for the the other battles to to arrive and decide what to what to do. Uh, but it's important that that. Uh, Almost invariably, battle commenced with an exchange of fire between the two, the, the longbowmen of the opposing forces. Um, as we've seen, their use was uh, was mostly neutralized. Important mm, episodes of, let's say, an asymmetry in the number of archers are um, the superiority in the Lancastrian ones at uh, Edgecote and the Yorkist ones at Tev. Uh, to Kisbury. Um if excuse me if I butchered the, the pronunciation. Um, in the battles of the Wars of the Roses, there is also no shortage of mercenaries, mostly British ones. We find them in, at Bosworth Field and at Stoke, um, Irish and Scots, uh, first of all, but we find also continentals such as uh, French, uh, Burgundians, and German pikemen. The, the latter are um, important to to report because they were killed up to the, the very last at Battle of Stoke when their fellow Irish mercenaries that were brave but unarmored uh, left the field. Uh, this is interesting for a number of reasons. Well, we know the Irish were generally poorly armored and they, they, they 
mastered mostly hit and run tactics. They were kind of archers, javeliners, and so on. But the German mercenaries here represent a type of trooper that is, you know, increasing importance in the in, you know, in the continent. And we find certain areas of Germany a resurgence, specifically these, you know, tough infantry, um, from areas that were also not particularly developed from a political social point of view. We talk we we talk about this. Um, Speaking of, there is a video made about 15th century German warfare, and um, the, the, the it's, it's a bit of a constant break. The fact that the word that the Germans maintained or stood their ground, also to the death fundamentally, and this speaks for the the importance of pikes that uh, were now being used profitably to to resist to, to the last in a prolonged fort, uh, which is different. In fact, what we find in this uh, English infantries instead. However, it's understandable that the participation of foreign mercenaries in a civil war uh, creates political problems that cannot be underestimated so that they, they could mm, you know, take over certain situations. So they were usually employed as a, as a last resort. Speaking of artillery, as we were saying before, during the Hundred Years War the English were convinced to, to use uh, uh, it in, in in response of, of mostly the French uh, firepower, and uh, during the Wars of the Roses, they the English never took field without them, without it. Um, however, only in the Battle of uh, Tewkesbury uh, is known uh, of any effectiveness of uh, such a shot in forcing the opponent to abandon a good defensive position. This is normal because artillery ha does hasn't uh, still that kind of tactical, you know, technological and tactical capacity of employment that will, you know, that probably makes it, uh, you know, a field arm, right? It's mostly from Marignano, right, uh, against the Swiss, the, you know, the, 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 during the Italian wars that we can't start speaking specifically of artillery employed successfully. Um, also. These uh, Wars of the Roses battlefields were much less full than uh, than what you know th those big square uh, of pikemen would would be in later times. So uh, also the battlefields were quite articulated, and entrenchment was aimed specifically also at resisting uh, from from artillery in in some instances. Um, the uh, the important in the period up to 1460. Um, artillery was employed in conjunction, in fact, with strongly entrenched field fortifications. We find it at Ludford Bridge in 1459, uh, or uh, uh, when the Earl of Salisbury dug, quote, a great deep ditch and fortified it with guns, carts, and stakes. Also at Northampton, Henry VI army had, quote, great ditches dug around the field to the river banks with enclosed which enclosed, excuse me, the wall army, right? And however, towards the end of the Wars of the Roses, we find a decline, right, having occurred in in terms of um, such entrenchments that uh, might actually. I mean, the, the the Wars of the Roses, you know, lasted fundamentally thirty years, so there were some improvements in the adaptability of of the guns for field use, um, also preference for mobility over a policy of static defense, which is fascinating because in a way it shows that even in this more, let's say, conservative uh, English warfare, th there was a, an obvious dynami dynamization of, uh, of tactics due to the, the improvement of, of firearms technology. But it's probably not all, it's just a hypothesis. But for the rest, uh, as we were saying in the beginning, artillery was mostly used for sieges that didn't play a great um, role in uh, during the Wars of the Roses, because normally cities surrender to to the winners of pitch battles, and uh, you know as we've seen it, they were very short terms uh, battles aimed just at knocking out the the opponents, that individual guy, uh, magnate, and uh, what's the point of sieges, right? These were the same. The same centers were producing, in a, in a sense, this uh, this this rule, right? And 
they, they nobody cared to, to they didn't even have probably much many resources to force them you know to for him spending time with long sieges and so on um, we find also a scarcity of firearms in this context uh, because as we were saying before they were still too inferior to the longbows to be worth the expense this is not just a matter of um, or necessarily a matter of technology it's uh, actually simply a term in terms of availability of cost benefits depending on the English society the, the war market and so on uh, just some continental mercenaries uh, brought uh, arquebuses and uh, and fought uh, with it speaking of cavalry finally we were saying that uh, mounted, the mounted one didn't have much of an impact during the Wars of the Roses. We find troops such as the Herbingers um, or those in charge of housing and supplies that preceded the armies were also acted as a vanguard who you know, started clashes on, on horseback, uh, standing out as cavalry uh, you know, troops. But for the rest, the we know that the English also historically at this point from two centuries had had a predilection to fight dismounted right this is not true just for the men at arms but literally also the longbowmen during the French uh, chevauchés were basically mounted they were horse archers and dismounted altogether because of the tactical contingencies posed mostly by their numerical inferiority in front of the French they compensated with this defensive position entrenchments and all you know the tactics that we know uh, however, there are other, mm, I mean, some at least significant episodes of action on horseback, such as the um, probably the most famous one is the unfortunate charge of Richard the Third at Bosworth Field, um, or also the happy expedient of Edward the Fourth at Tew Casbury, who uh, had in just two hundred thousand cavalry in a wood and, uh, in a wood and leaving them to the decide to intervene, gave a decisive blow to the uh, battle outcome. Uh, this is a tactics that was pretty much standard in in medieval times, especially for, since the 13th century. That was mostly, you know, the idea of a, a concealed a reserve to attack. At the moment the the armies had come to grip and couldn't defend their flanks, was was always uh, there. The important thing was to to conceal it well, to hoping also that the enemy didn't have something similar and that would attack it before. And especially it required a perfect timing, perfect coup d'oeil to launch it straight. Um, at the end. In that case, uh, uh, in fact, the uh, we we have other examples. For example, the uh, at Towtown, uh, Edward the Fourth's cavalry was chased from the field for, uh, by the uh, Lancastrian cavalry early in the battle. Um, uh, the there were other employments like you, they, they could attack the enemy flank once the the enemy troops were had dismounted but not fully arrayed because that's what you actually also are waiting for to hit the enemy in the moment of evident vulnerability um, this happened this was carried out for example by Warwick at Barnet and by uh, the same Richard the third at Bosworth right uh, we have also uh, even as a variety of cavalry light one such uh, that one at Barnet um, and for the rest, however, the we know that the praxis was to arrive like it, you know, historically, especially in, in England, it was like consider think about since Anglo-Saxon time. In the idea that uh, yes, the, the fighters arrived on the field on horseback to, to fight dismounted, right? It's been a bit abused historically as a as a notion, but in this case. Um, it seemed to have been the, the practice. It was a here we can't generalize, but aside from whichever political reason or military contingency, whatever, um, there was also the sense that uh, you know if you were dismounted, you, you you wouldn't run, right? You stood your ground and 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 fought, which in chivalric terms was you know it's kind of a of a big deal. Uh, Comin says that Edward the Fourth won his nine battles, quote, all of which were fought on foot, right? Interesting is also the Italian visitor Domenico Mancini uh, during 1482-83 uh, that uh, left uh, very interesting descriptions of uh, the English uh, soldiers, their equipment, and so on. And he, he observed that the English used their horses not 
to fight from just to trans from horseback just to uh, you know the horses just to transport them on the battlefield because he writes quote on reaching the field of battle the horses are abandoned and they all fight together under same condition so that none should hold any hope of flight and that's exactly what we're saying um, we could add a lot of further you know probably what we didn't stress specifically is the the physicality of the engagements. I mean, the idea that most of these battles were uh, won by a combination of archery hand strokes between the opposing bodies of dismounted men at arms, right? Um, and that's a big deal because it really gives you the, the dimension, especially given, as we've seen, that these troops were mostly dismounted. How, you know, how much strength, how much determination, and um, first, uh, uh, you know, person engagement this from the side, even the commanders of those who had invested in this all, um, this, uh, this battles entailed. Uh, for the rest, however, there is a strategical note to add. Finally, that is the, um, in fact, the specific characteristics of the Wars of the Roses campaigns that were short, short, right, but intense, and. That's the very Clausewitzian, that is very political type of campaign, right? The the these mm, these campaigns, as we've seen, had few sieges. Um, they they didn't care about plundering cities or devastating territories. They they aimed at the direct and decisive confrontation in the shortest time possible, right? That's all they cared about, um, and. Uh, the, the point of battle was to knock out the, the, the opponent to gain, go, uh, to gain control of the government. Pretty much it. Therefore, we can say, yes, that the, the populations, uh, also the civilian crafts, were not particularly affected uh, uh, by, by the Wars of the Roses, right? You know, it doesn't matter how radical this war actually was, and we will have to make a video, about, actually multiple videos about the Wars of the Roses, uh, surely one about the women of the Wars of the Roses, because dynastically speaking, they, they were some um, the most important players in here. Uh, the um, Well, the dynastic problem altogether, but also other aspects. But here there is a list of the various campaigns that give you an idea of how short these uh, these wars properly were right so we find 1455 uh, from May the 18th to May the 22nd uh, campaign that uh, fo you know culminated with the, the first battle of St. Albans May the, second, uh, the 22nd 1455 so basically this campaign it lasted five days 1459 from mid-September to mid-October 30 days uh, here were the battles of, of Bloor Heath Fought on September uh, there the twenty third and Ludford Bridge between uh, I mean the twelfth and thirteenth of October. In fourteen sixty, uh, the campaign lasted from June twenty sixth to July the nineteenth, and from December to uh, the ninth to uh, December the thirtieth. We have the battles of Northampton on July the tenth and Wakefield on December the thirtieth. So basically, in one year we have forty six days of war. Um, in 1461, campaigns lasted from February 2nd to the 26th, and from March the 13th to May the 1st. We have the battles of Mortimer's Cross on February 2nd, the 2nd St. Albans, February the 17th, uh, Fairbridge on March the 27th, 28th, Towton uh, on March the 29th. Uh, so in total, we have 75 days, and um, also the campaign about, uh, against the Welsh um, last 30 days uh, with the, the, the small battle culminating in the small battle of Toot Hill on October the 16th. Then we have the campaign of 1462-1463 uh, that lasted from October the 25th to January the 6th. Uh, this was 74 days revolving uh, around the Lancastrian occupation of the York uh, and the Yorkist um, Liberation of the castles of Elnwick, Bamberg, and uh, Dustenburg in Northumbria. In 1464, the campaign lasted from 
uh, April 24th to May 15th. We have the battles of Hedgley Moor on April the 25th and uh, Hexham on May the 15th. 22 days in total. 1469, the same. For, uh, 22 days. Campaign lasts from July the 5th to the 26th. Uh, and uh, we have the Battle of Edgecote on July the 26th. In 1470, the campaigns lasted from March the 6th to April the 14th and from September the 13th to October the 6th. We have the Battles of Lowscote Fields on March the 12th. Uh, this is where also um, Edward the Fourth was deposed. So we have 64 days in total. In 1471, the campaign lasted 75 days from March the 14th to May the 27th. We have the Battles of Barnet on April the 14th and Tewkesbury uh, on May the 4th. And there is also the failure, uh, the failed attempt by uh, of the Falkenberg bastards uh, to assault London. In 1483, the campaign lasted 22 days from October the 18th to November the 2nd. This is the Buckingham Rebellion. In 1485, 16 days from August the 7th to the 22nd, Battle of Bosworth Field on August the 22nd. Finally, we have 1487, uh, the Battle of Stoke, right? Uh, the camp uh, fought on June the 16th, the campaign of uh, which lasted 13 days between June the 4th and the 16th. Um, so, the, making a sum, we have um, a total number of war days of 464. In a total period of uh, uh, 11,718 days, that is a less than 4%, right? So, right, for 96%, of these years, marked by the Wars of the Roses, there was no military activity. Mm -hmm. This is very fascinating. It speaks much for for the English political and social background at that point. These wars in the first place. That, as I said, we we I think we never made. I think yes, made a video on late medieval England. I I addressed the Wars of the Roses, but never quite uh, made a dedicated one specifically on them. However. For now, we we stop it here. For uh, I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time.